there's a lot of different things that are advantages with doing vacant land. And I guess, you know, initially we, we kind of looked at it and went, hmm, that doesn't feel very sexy. Like it's a vacant canvas. There's nothing on it. Like what can we really do with that? The more that we looked into it, Brian, the more that we saw that actually you can do exactly the same things as what you do with a rehab property. It's just different. Welcome to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association, providing benefits and services to real estate investors and rental property owners for over 48 years. With your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. This episode is sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. Hello and welcome to episode 362. My guest today has built a portfolio of fix and flips as well as land deals here in the United States, and she's done it while living halfway around the world in Australia. Today, Alicia Jarrett is going to tell us how anyone can run a real estate business fully remotely without ever seeing the properties themselves. Alicia, welcome to the show. Brian, thank you so much for having me on. And yes, as you can tell by the accent, I am halfway around the world here in Australia. Nice and early in the morning, but thanks for so much for having me on. Tell us a little bit about yourself and how you got started investing in real estate, especially real estate in the United States. I know, right? That's often the first question. It's like, why Why the US? Why over here? <laughs> so my, my background actually has nothing to do with real estate, funnily enough. So I have a background in human resources, consulting, leadership development, public speaking, all of those types of things to do with the corporate world. But I guess what I would say is that I had a really great career in that space, but it wasn't really lighting me up, Brian. And it was one of those things that, you know, you needed to exchange your time for money every time you wanted to make money. And so I started to really get into real estate. I had a few properties here in Australia, but it's a very, very different market over here in Australia compared to the rest of the world. And so my business partner and I, we were just starting to look at different markets around the world about six years ago now. And the US, every time we started to research how to do deals in the US, it just kept coming up with all of these ticks to say, yeah, let's go and explore doing real estate over there. Bigger opportunity, bigger pool of things to be able to do and properties to be able to choose from. So we started doing some fix and flips and here we are six years later. We changed asset classes partway through that as well. And apart from the fact, I think I said to you a bit before we pushed record, for all intents and purposes, we are US-based. Our corporation is there. Our team is there. Everything is there. I just happen to be around the other side of the world. <laughs> what are the, the main differences between investing in Australia? You know, What are the opportunities in Australia versus investing in the United States? First and foremost, I think the, there's a couple of main differences between the Australian market and the US market. One of those is price point and entry point. So where I live in Melbourne, Australia, fantastic city for anybody who hasn't been, come on over and visit. So Melbourne, Australia, the average, and I'm just talking the average price point to get into a home. I'm not talking the upper end of the market. I'm just talking midpoint is just uh, under a million. So it's a very expensive market to be in. Vacant land, which is also the asset class that we do a lot of now, it, it doesn't, you don't walk down a street and, and just see a vacant property like, like you do in the US. It just doesn't exist. I mean, it's only really, really in the, in the outer areas, if you like, as to where that exists. And it's really only developers that go out and start to utilize that vacant land for property development, not your average person like, like me. So price point and entry to market is one. Second is the cost of contractors and resources. It's almost 10 times what it is in the US. And I'm not kidding when I say that. And the third is access to data. We very much in the US have a data-driven business, which tells us, you know, through data, where should we go and look for properties? Who do we target? How do we get information about them? Things like that. In Australia, that data is, we have all the data, Brian, but it's on lockdown. Privacy laws and different things don't allow us to really access that data and then use that data in a way that can help drive our businesses. So all of the things in the US are definitely different in how business is done as well. 
those points that you just made are what brought you to the United States as an investor, but a remote investor. And I know you got your start with fix and flips. Talk about that. How do you do fix and flips in the United States from Australia? I guess the first thing is we did jump on a plane and we used to come over uh, every couple of months. We'd come over and spend some time in the US. We were in some different mastermind groups and forming our relationships with contractors, realtors, title companies, all of those things. So the very first one that we did, we bought remotely. We we literally jumped on the phone to some real estate agents in Florida, up in Jacksonville, Florida, where we did our, our first few properties. And we just said, hey, we're looking to invest. Here's our criteria for the types of properties that we want. Here's our ARV, our, our after repair value. Here's what we're looking at. So running through some numbers. And at that point, I guess the thing is when you're a real estate investor and it's about doing deals and and making money, but also putting people back into homes, we've always got to take the view and and the stance that we are not the end user, right? It's, It's a product at that point. So don't get emotionally attached to the properties. So therefore, it was more about criteria than is the property beautiful? Do, do, do I want to live in it? So we bought our first property remotely just through our, our realtor, checking things out and building a relationship with our realtor. Once we'd bought the property and the rehab had started, we jumped on a plane and went on over. And that was really a case about meeting our, our rehab team going in and doing a lot more research in that area where we had that first property. And I remember at the time, we actually hired our realtor for a day. His name is Michael Cassidy, and he's in in Jacksonville for anyone who wants a fantastic realtor, go and look him up. We hired him for a day and we said, we're all yours. Drive us around Jacksonville, which is a huge city. Drive us around and show us the opportunities here. What are the areas? Now, this is going back six years ago, right? We're doing rehabs and fix and flips was still really accessible. I mean, the single family market now is very saturated, but drive us around. Tell us what the opportunities are in Jacksonville. Tell us the areas where there's still off-market deals and let's go and have a look at some properties. And we really just got to know the areas, you know, in, in, a, in a really hands-on way. Then when we came back to Australia and new deals came up and he would call us or we'd find one and we'd get him to go and have a look, we now had a lay of the land. We kind of knew a little bit more. But but from then on out, we've pretty much done everything remotely. What are some of the, the challenges that you faced in being remote? So, I mean, the main challenges, particularly when we were doing houses, the main challenges was, you know, not being on site to be able to eyeball things as easily as what you'd want. And that includes eyeballing your contractors and the work that they're doing. So one of the last houses that we did, now this is the blessing in disguise here, One of the last houses that we did was not great. It was at that time where keeping contractors on site because everybody wanted to do a fix and flip and everybody was dealing contractors and, you know, doing all of that. The last one wasn't great. The workmanship wasn't great. We had people leave the site. We had things that were stolen. We had a break in on the property where people went in and literally stole the fridge. (laughs) So the, the last one wasn't great. And that really, and as I said, blessing in disguise though, that really made us sit back and go, okay, maybe we need to look at a different asset class that is less risky and easier to be done from anywhere in the world. So that was that challenge is is not being there. The only other challenge though, Brian, is the fact that we don't have a social security number. We have what's called an ITIN, Individual Tax Identification Number. It's the same as a social security number, except for the fact that we are called aliens. And that's actually what we're called. (laughs) Now, you can see from looking at me, I'm not green. I don't have antennas coming out of my head. But from the, the perspective of the IRS, we are foreign, which also means that when it comes to things like private money lending or getting lending from bank, we we're at a bit of a disadvantage there. So then it becomes around building right relationships with different hard money lenders, people that want to go into deals with you, things like that. But otherwise, there really isn't that much that's challenging because I guess these days, Brian, everything can be overcome with the right mindset, the right exploration, you know, jumping online, jumping on the phone and saying, hey, we're in another country. What systems and processes could we use that would allow us to do business remotely? And unfortunately, the silver lining for COVID, fortunately or unfortunately, means that a lot more people are now comfortable doing things online. 
Talk about that, the hard money lend loans and making those relationships with people in the United States, and I'm assuming in the United States, who can loan money that you're not otherwise able to obtain from a traditional lender. How do those conversations tend to go? Pretty easy, actually. It's a, it's a case of picking up the phone and making the introduction and, and having a conversation about strategy. Strategy being, okay, back in the time when it was single family homes, it was here's our strategy, here's the price point we're going in on. Now, we did a lot of them ourselves without needing private money lenders. But for the ones that we did, it was really then looking at, well, what's the exit strategy? What are we thinking that the after repair value is going to be? Here's all the comps based upon the area. Here's all the research. Let's now structure a deal. Now that we do vacant land, it's exactly the same conversation. Here's a property. We're looking at turning this property around within two to three months. We want you to, to, to fund the, the deal itself. We'll fund the closing costs, but let's go in on this deal together. You know, I think OPM, other people's money, it's, it's a great strategy to use because the more cash that you've, that you've got that you can recycle through deals, the more deals you can do, right? So that's all about the velocity of money. And the conversations are pretty easy. I think as long as you are approaching them through a win-win situation and where the other person understands your strategy and what it is that you're doing, pretty easy. And these days, there are people out there that will lend on almost any asset class. Like we, we've got specific people that we work with that only do vacant land and they're private money lenders on vacant land, which a couple of years ago was unheard of. Well, let's talk about that transition because as you said, your last fix and flip was a blessing in disguise because it forced you to say, let's not do this anymore. Let's look for a different asset class and strategy. How did you come across vacant land? And can you explain what that strategy is? How we came across it was almost by accident. We were just doing some research on different asset classes. And as the, the online world works, different things kept popping up in front of us. And it was like, hmm, vacant land, let's explore that. As the people that do vacant land know, know this term, but the, the, four, the, the, the T's got no tenants, no toilets, no termites, and no trash. <laughs> so there's a lot of different things that are advantages with doing vacant land. And I guess, you know, initially we, we kind of looked at it and went, hmm, that doesn't feel very sexy. Like it's a vacant canvas. There's nothing on it. Like what can we really do with that? The more that we looked into it, Brian, the more that we saw that actually you can do exactly the same things as what you do with a rehab property. It's just different. So vacant land still comes with problems just like a house does. And the, the rehab, if you like, if I can put that in inverted commas, might be things like sorting out title issues, fixing a probate for intergenerational land, clearing the land, taking out trash from the land so that it's or removing squatters from the land if there's people that are there illegally. That's almost the, the fixing element of what you do with vacant land. Then rehabbing that and putting that back out into the market is exactly the same as what you do with, with a property. You're taking a property that nobody wants anymore, that has problems with it that they don't know how to fix or solve. You're solving that and you're putting that land back out into the market. Now, the exit strategy when it comes to putting it back out into the market is really interesting because you could do a, a buy and hold and put it into the market when that market heats up. You can do fix and flip. You can sell a finance that, that property. You can also subdivide the property and do a, what's called a forced appreciation on the property. So let's just say it's an acre and you want to divide it into four, four quarter lots for a nice, very easy forced appreciation. Or maybe it's 200 acres that you want to find a developer for and, and do some bigger projects with. So there's lots of different strategies that you can use to cash flow your, your properties or provide an instant cash boost. I'd like to take a moment to tell you about green property management. Not only do they manage everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area, they also manage my entire portfolio. So I can tell you from personal experience that their unique flat fee management style is worth a closer look. If you feel that your property isn't operating to its fullest potential, then green property management can help you take a holistic approach that will save you money, eliminate your headaches, and increase your net income. And if you're a 
property manager interested in applying Green Property Management's model, give them a call at 1-866-95-GREEN or visit them on the web at greenpropertymgt.com. If you're thinking of leaving your W-2 job and becoming a full-time real estate investor, one of the greatest costs you must consider is healthcare for you and your family. When I made this transition myself, I found the whole healthcare insurance process to be confusing and frustrating. That's why I'm glad I met Chad Creasy at RCB and Associates. Chad is a professional health insurance agent who helps real estate investors and small business owners understand and choose their best healthcare options. And best of all, his services are covered by the insurance company and won't cost you a dime. If you live in Michigan and are expecting a change in your health care insurance coverage for any reason or losing employer coverage or transitioning into Medicare, then you owe it to yourself to contact Chad Creasy at rcbassociatesllc.com. Can you give us some examples of actual land deals that you've done? I'll talk about my most favorite deal because this was one that required a lot of patience. So we brought a property, it's in Hillsborough County, Florida. It was 13 acres, but it was in an urban area. So it was surrounded by a lot of, you know, new developments, new new properties, existing areas that had commercial you know, shopping malls and strips and things in it. 13 acres, majority of it was wetlands, but it wasn't wetlands where it was underwater, right? It just had some some areas that had some some swampiness to it, if you like, but also it had a water table sitting underneath it. But we knew from those 13 acres by doing the research around that there was other properties around that had the similar features that had been mitigated and built on. So we had some precedent there. So we bought this property from the owner for $10,000. They did not know what to do with it. They didn't want to deal with anything to do with the wetlands and they just wanted it gone. So we bought it for $10,000, including our closing costs and including getting a survey and wetlands mitigation report done. So once we got that wetlands mitigation report, we knew, Brian, there was no endangered species. There was no flora or fauna on the site that was protected. We knew what, what we were dealing with then about the type of wetlands that it was. So then it was about being patient and waiting for the right builder that saw the right vision that we did. We put a massive, I guess I'm going to call it almost a billboard, but it wasn't on a billboard stand with lights, but it was one of those signs that's double-sided. So no matter what what direction you were driving from, you could you could see it. And we put a big board out the front that said, hey, 13 acres, ready for development, give us a call. We advertised it online. We got a realtor in our team, Michael, who is wonderful. We got him involved. We got it on the MLS. We we also knew with this property, it was currently zoned residential, but the future designation of the property was zoned commercial, and that had already been approved. So it was multi-use, which was great. Now, we held on to that property, Brian, for nearly two years because this was one of those properties that we just needed the right buyer with the right vision that could see what we saw and the right patience and understanding to know what to go and do with that property. We sold it two years later for 197000 We We didn't do anything to it. We just sat on it for two years. 197 Congratulations. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Now that's our best deal to date. Best deal because we really, we didn't do anything. We just held it. So we paid taxes on it for two years, but the taxes were really minimal because it was, it was wetlands, right? <laughs> the, the person that bought it, They'd done wetlands mitigation before. They they were developers. They knew what to do with the property. And sometimes it's just about finding that right partner. How do you market yourself, like for whether it be for hard money lenders or to find properties? I mean, what, what is your marketing process? I guess our marketing process is twofold because you've got your acquisitions marketing and you've got your dispositions marketing. Acquisitions is super easy, mainly because I think I mentioned to you also Not only are we land investors and real estate investors, but we also have a real estate investing marketing company called Supercharged Offers that's very data-driven. So we've got a system in place, Brian, that takes data, where we're going to go after our properties, and then does a combination of both online and offline marketing direct to those owners of properties to say, hey, you've got just like you do with single family, right? You've got a property, you haven't done anything with it. Do you want to sell it? So we've got our acquisitions engine of always marketing to sellers and owners to see if they want to get rid of their properties. Once we get the property under contract, it then becomes about the exit strategy for those properties. Now, if it is a property that we want a cash injection with, with getting a a JV partner on, then it's a case of putting together the portfolio for that property, which is just a 
a really nice information pack that we send out to our, our lenders that says, hey, here's this opportunity. Here's the piece of land. Here's all the comps. Here's what we plan on doing with that property. And here's our potential exit strategy. Do you want in? Doesn't get much more difficult than that. Outside of that, though, if, if we don't need a private money lender on, on that land, Brian, the dispositions marketing is super easy these days because vacant land has its own products and services out there, just like single family homes do. So with vacant land, you can put it on land.com and the affiliated sites, which is Land and Farm and Lands of America. You can put it on another service called Prime Land Exchange that creates it into Facebook ads and gets it out. You can put it on the MLS with our realtor. We've got loads of different mechanisms that we use to get that property out there and find a buyer for it. And there's specific places that land people go to find properties, just like people go to Zillow to find houses. What's your risk mitigation look like on these land acquisitions? Do you ever run into problems where you lose money or you end up spending way more than you expected? Yeah, look, I think that goes with any asset class, Brian, because as as the term is right, your, your podcast is about real estate investing. We are investors. Inherent in that term is risk. Now, you will have some deals that just go like a dream and you'll have other deals that have problems. The thing is with vacant land, the losses tend to be not as big as other asset classes where there is a physical building and and improvement on on the property, right? Because with vacant land, you tend to be able to uncover the problems up front pretty easily. Now, you can, in your due diligence period with uh, with buying a, a property or getting that property under contract, if you get a title commitment done and you can see that, okay, now there's a probate that needs doing, we can already have that conversation with the the property owner to say, all right, there's a probate that needs doing. So tell us how many family members are involved? What are we talking about here? And then we can go and get a price on that from our probate attorney to understand what that cost might be. Now, if the cost is is still okay and it goes along with what we're getting the property for and what our potential exit strategy is, great. We'll go and get that probate done. If the probate exceeds what the property is worth, we will just provide a solution to the the property owner and we'll we'll have that honest conversation. Say, look, we we now understand what the potential cost is for that. We're no longer going to go ahead with the deal, but we've got the title commitment done. We've understood what what the probate process is. We're going to introduce you to our probate attorney so that if you and your family want to go and get this done so that you can then sell your property, here you go. So we're always thinking of solutions with our property owners to really help them because a lot of the times they just they don't know where to start with a lot of this stuff. But the risk itself is is really just understanding what needs to be done for that property, the cost involved, and does that cost outweigh what the property is worth or not? That's the basic risk mitigation. When you are talking with the owners of, of the land, what are, what are some of the psychological aspects that you're dealing with? Are they like eager sellers? Are they reluctant? I mean, how how do you approach them? They're a bit of both because I guess it just depends, like any property owner, what situation are they in? Now, if they're going through a divorce or a settlement where they're, they're no longer attached to the property at all, they, they just want it gone, they're pretty motivated and they just say, you know, take, take it off my hands, I'm done. But let's just say they're in a situation where there's been a, a death in the family and maybe it's intergenerational land that, that, that they're, they're quite attached to. Or maybe they bought that property, you know, years ago with dreams of putting their their dream home on it and that hasn't worked out because there's job loss or illness in the family or things like that. Often you're dealing with some pretty emotional situations there. And and it it really is is like any other asset class. You approach that with a high degree of compassion, integrity, you know, really thinking through with that property owner, what are their goals? What do they really want to see happen with that property? And trying to help them out with that as much as you can. So this business, like any other business, is it's a human-centered business first and foremost. You've got to have the right conversations with your, your sellers to really build that trust and rapport with them around what they want to see happen and what you need to have happen in relation to that property. Alicia, before we hit record on this conversation, you had had some advice about those who have employees. I think you were talking about employee retention credits. Can you say a couple of things about that? Absolutely, Brian. Absolutely. So we've got another business. We've got a number of businesses in the US, but we're always looking at ways to do business better. And employee retention credits. So obviously throughout COVID, 
you know, people had some some real issues with their businesses throughout COVID and a lot of people suffered. But if if you've got W-2 employees that you can actually show that from one year to the next, you know, as we are this year, if you did suffer any financial burden as a result of COVID, you can actually apply to get employer retention credits where any taxes that you've paid throughout that time in relation to your employees, you can get that paid back and you don't have to even pay it back again. It's like, here, you know, the IRS is saying, take this money back again because we realized that you had hardship throughout COVID and there's ways and means of doing that. But a lot of people either don't know that the employer retention credits are available to them and they also don't know how to access them. And it's very easy. There's just a couple of online forms that you need to fill in and people can come and, and come my way and I can help them out with that. And once they get that cash injection, we're actually saying as real estate investors, if you get that cash back, and by the way, it can be a, a, up to like $26,000 per employee. So if you've got a couple of employees, you can get a lot of money back. And we're then helping customers to say, once you get that cash injection, put that towards your future marketing for your real estate, your real estate investing, whether or not that's building up more acquisitions marketing or doing a rebranding for your organization and starting off 2023 with you know, a, a new way of approaching your business or putting it towards things like business consulting, where you might want to look at your systems and processes, anything like that. Because the minute you get a cash injection in your business, the smartest thing to do is to put that into something where that cash is going to grow. You know, put a dollar in, get three or four dollars back. That's really what real estate investing should be about. So yeah, employee retention credits is a great way for also people to, to grow their business. What is your favorite hack or software app? So as a land investor, one of them is called Land Glide. It's a fantastic app that you can be out at a property and look up the APN for that property and virtually almost like walk the, the perimeter of the property. It will show you almost like an online survey, right? Where the property lines are, some information about the boundaries and some great stuff, particularly when you're doing property that's more rural, that might not have fences or boundary lines and things like that. So Land Glide is a fantastic app. The other one for me, because I am in Australia and we have customers, we've now got customers in more than 13 countries all around the world that, that do real estate investing in the US as well as a team that is global. I've got a, a app that I use about 10 times a day called Time Buddy. It's a free app and it lines up where everybody is in, in all the time zones and allows me to work a lot smarter when it comes to time zones. <laughs> so Alicia, this is your opportunity to, to pitch yourself, let our listeners know how they can get a hold of you, find out more about you, where you would like them to, to go to, to learn these things. Fantastic, Brian. Thank you for the opportunity for being on here. So I guess if anybody wants to learn more about investing in vacant land, or if they'd love to know more about real estate marketing, both the acquisitions and the disposition side, particularly on the acquisition side, making that very data-driven and, and looking at both online and offline marketing, give me a call or drop me a line. Uh, my email is alicia, so A-L-I-C-I-A at superchargedoffers.com. They can also jump onto superchargedoffers.com and we've got some free resources on there. They can download our ebook on online and offline marketing. They can also download our business growth plan, which is a strategy session for real estate investors to really get, get clear on their strategy for their asset class. And they can give me a call on 888-538-5478. They can also go online on Facebook, Supercharged Offers, or just Alicia Jarrett on Facebook. Hit me up. More than happy to have a call with people about their strategy, their business, and just, you know, network. Well, Alicia, thank you so much for getting up early to be on the show. I know it's like 5.45 a.m. That's fine, Brian. That's actually my normal start time. The only catch-22 being halfway around the world is I tend to start very early to maximize my, my US time. <laughs> that makes perfect sense. Thanks for sharing your experiences investing in the United States versus Australia, your early start in fix and flips, how you transitioned to land investments, the marketing strategies that you shared, as well as the employee retention credit advice that you shared. Thank you so much for coming on the show. And it's been a real pleasure talking with you. 
Thank you so much, Brian. I want to thank everybody for listening to this episode. I'm your host, Brian Hamrick from Hamrick Investment Group. And you can find out more about me by going to higinvestor.com. That's H-I-G investor.com. And you can also ask questions and join us on Facebook by going to RPOA, Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast. This episode was sponsored by Green Property Management, managing everything from single family homes to apartment complexes in the West Michigan area. Find out more at greenpropertymgt.com. And RCB and Associates, helping real estate investors and small business owners navigate the complex world of health insurance and Medicare benefits at rcbassociatesllc.com. You've been listening to the Rental Property Owner and Real Estate Investor Podcast, brought to you by the Rental Property Owner Association. You can find out more at rpoaonline.org. If you enjoyed this podcast, please go to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and review. 